Welcome to another episode of Clinicians Brief, the podcast, the conversations behind the content. I'm your host, Dr. Alyssa Watson, and today we are taking a deep dive into appropriate uses for the medication gabapentin. Gabapentin, as a lot of you know, has been increasingly prescribed by both human physicians and veterinarians for a whole bunch of different painful conditions. In addition, lots of veterinarians like to use it as an anxiolytic and to facilitate handling in fearful animals. But we know that evidence showing the efficacy of gabapentin, especially for acute pain, is kind of limited. And I think there's definitely some concern in the veterinary community that gabapentin is being overprescribed. So today, we've asked Dr. Becca Reeder, a staff anesthesiologist at Angel Animal Medical Center in Boston, Massachusetts, and an assistant professor of anesthesia and analgesia at the Cummings School of Veterinary Medicine at Tufts University, whew, that was a mouthful, <laughs> to come on the show so that she could discuss her top five uses for gabapentin in dogs and cats. Hi, Dr. Reeder. Thank you so much for joining us today. Hi, thank you so much for having me. I think this is going to be a really great conversation. Um, but before we get into all of that, is there, um, could you just introduce yourself to the audience? Tell us a little bit about your background. How did you end up, um, you know, at Angel sure. and at Tufts? Absolutely. Uh, yeah, so I am, like you said, an anesthesiologist, both at Angel Animal Medical Center and Tufts. Um, I did my residency and veterinary school at Tufts University and have um, kind of bounced back and forth between academia and private practice since I finished my residency. Um, and basically, kind of the way it morphed out is that I just enjoy seeing a little bit of both types of anesthesia and both types of practice. So I split my time between the two hospitals. Um, working with students and residents um, and at Tufts and then working through kind of like the caseload of, of private practice at Angel. So it's been really great that I've been afforded the opportunity to work at both places. Yeah, it's really nice when you have a passion for both things to be yeah. able to, to pursue <laughs> both of those. So exactly. All right. Well, I know that this is going to be a really great conversation. <laughs> and so I think we should just dive right in. Um, the sure. first thing I would like to talk about, if we could, is kind of the mechanism mm -hmm. of action of gabapentin. Can you walk us through sure. what the current understanding is of the mechanism of action? Yeah, actually, and I'm I'm really glad that this is what our, our kind of lead off topic is, because I think understanding the mechanism of action of gabapentin is kind of key to understanding where it fits into our practice. Um, the best part about it is that gabapentin is one of those drugs who has a little bit of a murky mechanism of action that we don't really know all that well. Um, if we kind of go back to where it was designed and originally intended, the original use for it was as an anti-epileptic drug. Mm -hmm. And what they were intending for human use was that it would be a centrally acting agonist at the GABA receptor, which is the major inhibitory receptor in the CNS. Um, so basically, if you look at gabapentin and then the GABA molecule, they're structurally very, very similar. They just added a little ring onto gabapentin, and that was to hopefully facilitate facilitate it getting through the blood-brain barrier a little bit easier. And unfortunately, despite all of those efforts, it ended up that gabapentin doesn't work at the GABA receptor. So it doesn't work at the receptor. It doesn't um, affect the GABA um, uh, like uh, metabolism, degradation, or even efficacy. So it really has not anything to do with GABA or gabapentin um, or the GABA molecule um, or receptor at all. So what we've kind of come to decide is that most likely gabapentin works at calcium channels that are on presynaptic receptors within the central nervous system. So what that does is it binds to the receptor and it blocks the influx of calcium into the presynaptic nerve terminals, and then it reduces the amount of excitatory neurotransmitters that come out. Um, so it's kind of totally unrelated to its intended use, um, but it, it basically kind of stems the tide of excitatory um, or painful um, mediators coming out of the nerve terminal. Okay. So not really the way that it was intended, yeah. um, but, exactly. but absolutely that can help us understand, you know, some of these recommendations mm -hmm. that we're going to go through now about when and when not yeah. to use it. Um, because... Right. Uh, yeah, definitely anticonvulsant therapy is not one of the, the uh, uses that you listed in the top five. So. Right. <laughs> exactly. So. Exactly. 
Now, you said that this was, you know, developed for for human medicine. That leads great into mm -hmm. my next question was it's FDA approved sure. for use in humans. Are there any veterinary right. labeled products? Right. Yeah. So there aren't any veterinary um, labeled products right now. So the only labeled use for gabapentin by the FDA is for um, as an anti epileptic drug or to treat neuropathic pain. And it's a very kind of narrow indication in people. It's neuropathic pain that's associated with either spinal cord injury, um, fibromyalgia, diabetes, or post herpetic neuralgia with it, which is like shingles. Um, so those are kind of the very, very limited um, indication that the FDA has approved the use of gabapentin for, and that's all in people. Um, so every other use, including our veterinary use, is extra label. Okay. It's also le it's also commercially available in oral capsules, mm -hmm. um, but also some solutions. Um, yep. I know that you know some of those solutions can contain xylitol and some other things that we right. really have some concern about. Um, so, sure. what about cats? Because this is a question that I see asked a lot. Mm -hmm. Do we have those concerns yeah. about gabapentin uh, solutions containing xylitol in cats the way that we do in dogs? Right. Yeah. And that's actually a really good question because um, because you're right. It's the liquid formulation of gabapentin that's available at human pharmacies, not necessarily any type of like veterinary compounded formulation. Um, but all of those liquid formulations at human pharmacies, most of them do contain xylitol. They have to make it sweet so that we'll, you know, tolerate <laughs> taking it. Um, and so the concern for sure with dogs is that we know it can be toxic to dogs um, and cause um, liver injury and hypoglycemia. But oddly enough, um, despite how difficult cats like to make it for us, um, cats don't seem to be affected by xylitol. So um, it certainly would facilitate easier dosing in cats because you can precisely dose it out with the liquid formulation. And thankfully, that's the one toxicity in cats we don't have to worry about. I know. Finally, one thing that cats could be yeah. a little bit easier at, right? Exactly. Because <laughs> they don't usually exactly. work with us that way. <laughs> Exactly. Um, we won't give them any ideas. <laughs> I've also seen uh, a little bit of, you know, certainly when we're looking at, at dosing small dogs, um, at dosing cats, mm -hmm. um, I've seen some chatter about transdermal preparations. Uh, what's mm. the current understanding about transdermal re uh, preparations? Are there any out there that are effective? Yeah, there's there have been... I would say like maybe one or two studies looking to see if transdermal gabapentin is effective specifically in cats. Um, and I would say that the evidence is kind of similar. You'll notice a similar theme that the evidence is very sparse, <laughs> a little bit conflicting, um, and maybe hindered a little bit by small sample size or lack of control populations. Um, so there's two studies that I know of um, that have looked at it, and one of them found kind of not very um, like underwhelming results in terms of the absorption of gabapentin um, transdermally in cats. And then the most recent one, um, they looked at it both in vitro and in vivo. Mm -hmm. And so they looked at it kind of histologically in um, kind of feline cadavers um, and found when mixed with a lipophilic structure, it was absorbed. And then they looked at it in a, a live cat population and looked at plasma levels. And also a little bit interestingly, they did some pain scoring for, with some elderly cats. Um, and what they found was that yes, it's absorbed. Um, they were able to detect it in plasma in cats. Um, and that they found that the pain scores were lower in cats that received gabapentin. The one caveat I would say to that, if you really look at it, is that um, again, it was a very small sample size. The um, the plasma levels were kind of variable and they were all pretty significantly lower than what you would get given orally. And the, the person who was doing the pain scoring wasn't blinded oh. <laughs> to the treatment. So I'm a, I'm a huge believer in the power of placebo mm -hmm. and, <laughs> and things and, you know, like kind of confirmation bias. Mm -hmm. So I, I think that that um, study needs to be uh, like tweaked uh, kind of, <laughs> Tweaked, tweaked and maybe taken, maybe we could say that, yes, mm -hmm. it's absorbed when combined with the lipophilic mm -hmm. structure, but I think the effect on, on pain scores and, and if it's absorbed to a plasma level that's really going to be effective mm -hmm. for any purpose is still kind of to be determined. 
And then that too kind of brings me to the next thing I wanted to talk to you because in your article, you had talked about um, how frequently gabapentin should be dosed in order to be effective. Mm -hmm. And you really right. strongly feel that gabapentin <laughs> should be given on a schedule and not given on an as right. needed basis. And, and I mm -hmm. had no idea. Yep. I found that really interesting. So can you talk a little more to that? Yeah. So they've, they've done a couple of pharmacokinetic studies on gabapentin in both dogs and cats. Um, and it's it, very nicely for us. It is very rapidly absorbed, but it's also very rapidly eliminated. Um, so what they found was that in dogs, you need to be giving at least probably around 10 mg per keg um, every eight hours to keep those plasma levels therapeutic. Um, and then in cats, it's even more, it's really even every six hours. And so, I mean, if you think about again, dosing cats four times a day with it's <laughs> an oral medication that, you know, just makes the most compliant owner, um, it gives them a challenge. Um, one additional kind of caveat I would say to that is that all, all the papers that we use both in veterinary and human medicine, when we're talking about therapeutic plasma levels, were the ones that were determined as an anti-epileptic level in people. So we, we don't really know what's the analgesic plasma level either in people or in veterinary species. So it's, it's all still a little bit murky of, of what level we're looking for. Okay. And then let's talk side effects because um, we definitely see them. What are some of the sure. frequently seen side effects, you know, when we, especially I feel like when we start on the medication. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, gabapentin, I would say the most common side effects in, in veterinary species that are reported is sedation. Um, you can also see a little bit of ataxia and hind end weakness. Um, some people have reported um, muscle tremors in veterinary patients. Um, so those are, the, I would say, the most common. And again, like you said, um, especially as it's people are or patients are just being started on it. Um, and those effects certainly do wane over time. Um, in people, they're starting to report, um, in addition to sedation, um, they kind of report um, visual disturbances, dizziness, um, and also respiratory depression. Mm -hmm. if, and they see it in people really? um, in kind of like the post-operative care unit, um, significantly more likely to have um, some sort of respiratory event, whether that means they need supplemental oxygen or um, to be reintubated or to be on a ventilator, it kind of runs the gamut. But they, the um, a recent meta analysis in people found that there was a pretty significant correlation between kind of like a perioperative gabapentinoid and a respiratory event. Something definitely to keep in mind yeah. and maybe look <laughs> exactly. into in the future for our patients. Too. Yeah, so, exactly. Um, one of the other things, gabapentin, you know, the, the regulatory status, I feel like is mm -hmm. kind of fluid right now changing. I, I believe yeah. that it is actually a controlled substance in Kentucky. Am I right about that? Okay. I, I wasn't able to see that it was an actually a controlled substance, but mm -hmm. it might be on the prescription monitoring program, okay, like that you're sure. required to log right. it and track yes. it. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Exactly. That makes sense. Um, what, yes. what do you, do you think that there is the potential for a bit to come up? actually become controlled either, you know, at the state or federal level? Yeah, I actually, I really hope so. Um, I will, I'll be honest in that I, I, I do hope that there are tighter restrictions on it. Um, it's, it's kind of hard to change the um, controlled level of control status of a drug once it's gone to market it requires a whole new kind of like relabeling it's like where like propofol should probably be controlled because it's been abused mm -hmm. in the past it's pretty hard to to change that status um but it can be tightened in terms of restrictions for um dispensing number of refills sure. and and needing to report people who have or just log people who are receiving that prescription um and the reason i am am hopeful that that does um kind of come about is because it's originally kind of marketed as a very safe alternative to opioids mm -hmm. in human medicine. Um, and like we just talked about, we're actually coming to find that there are pretty significant side effects associated with it. 
But what's what's really concerning to a lot of people is that it's become a recreational street drug. Um, and so people who are doing recreational drugs are taking kind of like super clinical doses, like massive dosing amounts um, orally or it can be snorted or, or what have you. And um, they're using that to get high and they report that they feel like an opioid buzz or the kind of dissociative effects that you might find with with other dissociative drugs. Um, so it's really starting to become quite prevalent and it might be, I would say like the overall prevalence within the general population, like in your neighborhood or what have you, is probably pretty low, but the people who have had a history of opioid abuse, which is precisely the drug that it's kind of marketed and kind of pushed to be used for, um, they're much more likely to abuse it. And then the really concerning thing is, like I mentioned, that problem with respiratory depression is that if it's combined um, with an illegal opioid and the, the person overdoses, they're significantly more likely to um, either end up on a ventilator after an overdose if they present to the emergency department or even have a fatal overdose. So it's it's really concerning that it can have pretty extreme consequences when mixed with opioids. So really important for everybody to have that information, you know, even though we get so focused on our patients and doing the best that we can for them, realizing that there is, you know, a person on the other end of that leash and we need to keep in mind what's going on with the whole picture. Yeah. Right. So exactly. So now that we have a better understanding of, you know, how gabapentin works, what it was originally made for, but what we kind of understand now, right. let's talk about, you know, where you think gabapentin is really clinically useful. Sure. And so mm-hmm. um, for one of those things, it's pre-visit sedation and anxiety. Um, so sure. what kind of evidence is out there for, for using gabapentin in this capacity? Right. So there are a few papers that are that have been published that look at kind of like a high dose of gabapentin um, given to cats before coming to the hospital and that it seems to reduce kind of um, hospital associated fear or anxiety in cats. Um, I haven't found it actually published, but I know that some of my colleagues are working on um, looking at gabapentin um, in part in combination with something called the chill protocol to alleviate um, fear or anxiety in dogs before coming to the vet hospital. So I think there's a little bit of data and it's still kind of coming out, but basically what we're doing is we're taking advantage of um, that sedation side effect of the drug and using it to kind of take the edge off of patients before they come in. Yeah, we actually, Clinician's Brief has a really nice article on the chill protocol. Yes, and I've seen it. It's, it's one of our very, very, <laughs> very popular ones. Um, yep. So could you just, I mean, if you know it off the top of your head, could you walk through the medications sure. that, that are used in the chill protocol and, and what gabapentin is combined with there? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so the chill protocol was the brainchild of Alicia Karras, who is an anesthesiologist and one of my mentors at Tufts. Um, and I remember as a resident, I was like, what is this like voodoo magic that, that she's come up with to like help patients um, feel a little bit less stressed in the in the hospital? And, and so I kind of like delved in a little bit to each drug that's used in it. And it it all kind of makes sense. Um, So basically what the chill protocol is, is it's a high dose of gabapentin. So if we think about the dosing for it, if we're using it as an analgesic or what have you, it's usually about 10 mg per keg. Um, But the chill protocol uses double that, 20 mg per keg of gabapentin um, the night before a hospital visit and then the morning of that visit. And the reason for that is the way Dr. Karras had explained it to me is that the night before the routine is the is normal for the patient that's going to go to the vet the next day. They're not suspecting anything. They're going for a walk at the normal time. They're getting their dinner at the normal time. They haven't learned to so read the Google calendar of- yet. <laughs> <laughs> Exactly. So they get a little bit of sedation kind of slipped in there. Um, So they already have without like their, you know, fight or flight system firing, they've already got a little something that's going to help them kind of chill out a little bit. Um, And then the next morning, you give them another dose of gabapentin again at that at that kind of double dose. Um, And then it's combined with oral transmucosal ACE. So it's the injectable formulation of ACE promazine. um, That's just kind of squirted onto the gums of um, it's both dogs and cats we use it on. But um, 
And then um, melatonin, oddly enough, is, is also used. Um, and so I looked it kind of into it and gabapentin has been used a little bit to kind of um, prevent, um, they call it pain catastrophizing in people, like people who get really, really nervous. Like I think about me when I go to the dentist, mm -hmm. like I'm terrified they're going to hit a nerve. So like that, I, and like, I'm just tense and nervous about it. So they use it in people to kind of prevent that type of nervous behavior before, um, some type of medical procedure. Um, and the same thing with melatonin is kind of used to treat anxiety in people. So all kind of three of those things mixed together to make a patient who can still walk in, but doesn't really care about what's um, happening. And it, it just facilitates um, kind of fear-free and lower stress handling of patients um, for their visits. And you did mention that we can use it in cats too. Do you see mm -hmm. a, you know, a significant difference between its efficacy in cats versus dogs? I would say that I wouldn't, I, there's nothing that I could say has been like documented, but if I said anecdotal, anecdotally, um, I would say that cats seem to like chill out and relax and vibe out on gabapentin alone a little bit more than dogs do. So you could give a cat that high dose of gabapentin. Um, and interestingly enough, one of the studies that looked at it um, in cats was with feral cats. Um, and you don't have a weight on a feral cat, right? So they just got like a capsule of gabapentin in their kind of food to lure them into the trap. Um, and so the dose range was between 20 and 50 milligrams per kilogram in those cats. So I feel pretty comfortable with fairly high doses in cats. Mm -hmm. um, and they just tend to kind of relax and, and not really care as much about what's going on around them. Um, dogs, I really find kind of need all three um, of, of the drugs to really get them. If there is especially if they're particularly fearful of, of going to the vet, they really need kind of that cocktail. Um, another kind of like charisism is that she would always say that like one plus one plus one equals five. So that the additive effects mm -hmm. of all of those drugs. Um, and I think that sometimes the dogs who are really, really wound up at the vet just seem to need a little bit more. Yeah, that, that totally makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> I, and we're going to talk a couple about a couple other, you know, combinations mm -hmm. using gabapentin with other medications and things when we go into your, yep. your other indications, but what you were just mm -hmm. saying kind of made me stop because I, I had just read a study just the other day about using mm -hmm. gabapentin in hyperthyroid cats um, that were coming mm -hmm. in to facilitate handling yep. and whether or not that was yep. that was contraindicated. And so um, mm -hmm. that just I are there any conditions, not other medications, but like actual physical mm -hmm. conditions that you're aware of where you're you would maybe not want to use gabapentin? Yeah, I think the the one that I would say one for sure and two maybe. Um, I would just use lower doses. But the one where I would say is it, it, it relatively contraindicated is patients with renal compromise. Um, and the reason for that is that gabapentin is metabolized and excreted, excreted as an active metabolite through the kidneys. Mm -hmm. um, so it really builds up in patients that have kidney injury. Um, I, um, when I was out in, in private practice, we had actually an, a, one of the doctor's own pets was cats was in the hospital, um, being kind of hospitalized for some sort of acute kidney injury and just became obtunded, um, because she was receiving gabapentin yeah. as well to kind of like chill her out mm -hmm. in the hospital. Um, but her kidney injury was so severe that it just built up and built up and built up and they were ready to put her through the MRI to figure out if she was having a neurologic problem. And it was like, it's the gabapentin, just stop the gabapentin. Oh. And they did. And, and, you know, she was back to kind of her normal mentation mm -hmm. a few days later. So I would say really, really cautious use in patients with, um, renal compromise. Um, the other one is, is kind of, um, patients with some type of central nervous system um, issue. And most what comes to mind is like a brain tumor because they have kind of a heightened um, uh, kind of effect of the drug. So you might really kind of over sedate them and you can't take it away. It has to kind of wear off. So if you, if you really don't want to overly sedate a patient, I'd be pretty cautious um, using high doses of it in patients with something like a brain tumor. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. So yeah. So the second indication that you talk about in the article is neuropathic mm -hmm. pain. 
Can you give us some right. like examples of conditions that result in neuropathic pain in veterinary patients? Sure. Sure. Um, so neuropathic pain is basically damage or injury to a, a nerve that's either in the central or peripheral nervous system. So kind of the classic one in veterinary medicine is going to be intervertebral disc disease in our, you know, our docs and friends or <laughs> whoever is our poster child for some type of disc herniation. So um, that would be probably the one that most commonly comes to mind. Um, but some other things you could think about would be like a dog who is hit by a car and has a brachial plexus avulsion, um, or some type of nerve impingement from, um, stenosis in the spinal cord or the canal. And, and there's like some sort of impingement on that nerve and have some type of nerve, um, nerve root pain is a, is a kind of good one to think about. And when you have that patient, is it, should you mm -hmm. reach for gabapentin as a first line treatment, a standalone treatment? Are you combining it with other medications? I would say unlikely as kind of like a standalone or first line. Um, it's certainly, if we think about the way it works um, through its mechanism of action, it, the neuropathic pain is the one type of pain that gabapentin is truly targeted towards um, by reducing those excitatory impulses and kind of pain signaling mediators like neurokinin or substance P. Um, it's going to decrease the release of those from the presynaptic nerve terminal to then kind of further excite pain signaling down the pathway. Um, but I neuropathic pain is also a really complex pain state. And so it usually requires um, a combination of different drug classes to truly keep it under control. So I would say that gabapentin is most likely in most instances um, would be like one component of a multimodal pain regimen for a patient with neuropathic pain, whether it be in combination with non-steroidal anti-inflammatory um, local anesthetics, um, opioids, um, regional anesthesia, something like that. Is it another day of back-to-back -back appointments? Have the drug information and tools you need always within reach. Plums offers continually updated drug information, easy to share guides for pet owners, and new tools like the Drug Interaction Checker, designed to help you spot risky drug combinations before they affect your patients. Streamlining your busy day begins at plums.com. Moving on to other types of pain where you really do feel mm -hmm. gabapentin is helpful, you talk about breakthrough mm -hmm. pain. So could sure. you define breakthrough pain? How is that different from the neuropathic pain that we just talked about? Sure. Um, breakthrough pain is basically a heightened pain state where you have um, continued pain when first line analgesics um, are administered, but don't seem sufficient to control the pain. Um, so if I think of like a really, really heightened pain state, I would think of like polytrauma, um, sometimes pancreatitis, necrotizing fasciitis, like some of those really, um, really painful conditions that are difficult to get under control. Um, and if, if you can bear with me, the easiest way that my brain thinks about if we're thinking about breakthrough pain and first and second line analgesics, I think about um, the food pyramid. And mm -hmm. I'm probably dating myself, but no, I had the food pyramid up, <laughs> so, <laughs> with your grains exactly. and yeah. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> so this is like the way my brain thinks about this. So um, you know, when I was growing up, the food pyramid was kind of the government telling mm -hmm. us what portion of, of food to put in our daily diet. And so back then, carbohydrates were at the bottom. Mm -hmm. And then you had fruits and vegetables, and then proteins. And then up at the tippy top was your kind of fats and sugars, and those were to be used sparingly. And so the way I think about it in terms of like the pain pyramid, um, is that those kind of layers are represent kind of the efficacy efficacy that we know for analgesics as well as kind of their strength of evidence for their use within our literature or what have you. And so I tend to think of um, opioids and um, local anesthetics as the base of our pain pyramid. Those are um, probably the most effective analgesics for 
moderate to severe pain. And we have a pretty good um, document of evidence for their efficacy. That's like opioids are considered gold standard in terms of analgesia, analgesia both in the human and veterinary literature. Um, and local anesthetics, they can stop the pain signaling in its tracks. So those are providing anesthesia and analgesia to those kind of painful areas. Um, and then in that middle area, I tend to think about non steroidal anti inflammatories on NMDA antagonists like ketamine. Mm -hmm. um, those have pretty good strength of evidence, um, but they probably would be insufficient on their own to treat moderate to severe pain. So they might be okay for kind of mild to moderate pain, but wouldn't be okay for an excruciatingly painful condition on their own. And then up at the top, I would consider drugs like gabapentin, Tylenol, um, um, amantadine, things mm -hmm. like that, that we have a little bit less evidence for their efficacy and for um, kind of the way they target pain pathways in terms of, of how they'd be used. And those should be used a little bit more sparingly when those that first or second layer is insufficient to control the pain um, that the patient is experiencing. Um, and then I would say that um, the concern about breakthrough pain is that if you don't get it under control, that's when you start to get maladaptive pain mm -hmm. um, and a heightened pain state that instead of being quote unquote protect protective is now going to start to be pathological um, and you get all sorts of um, kind of wind up pain and, and pain that's just really um, um, harmful to the patient. So when you're looking at gabapentin in that uh, you know, for that indication, what doses are you mm -hmm. using then? Because we talked a little bit about, you know, the real high doses mm -hmm. for the pre-visit sedation. Right. Um, so right. if you've already got things on board, like opioids, yep. you know, and mm -hmm. and those, how, where are you in your dosing when you're adding in the gabapentin? The dosing for the analgesic um, effectiveness, we think, is 10 milligrams per kilogram. Um, and again, in dogs, it really needs to be every eight mm -hmm. hours, um, three times a day. And in cats, up to four, potentially, <laughs> potentially if, we look, if we're going by the pharmacokinetic data. So, yeah. Um, so it, it just, it tends to be the 10 milligram per kilogram is a pretty safe spot to be, um, give or take a little bit. And that dosing frequency is important. So, so yeah, the, all of the ones that are as needed or um, once daily probably are really not reaching not, effective plasma levels. Not helping yeah. as much as we would have hoped. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly. So moving on, the next thing that you talk about using gabapentin for is osteoarthritis, but right. gabapentin doesn't have any anti-inflammatory properties. That wasn't anything that we right. listed when we were talking about the mechanism <laughs> of action. So where does it fit exactly. in when we're treating an inflammatory condition? Right. And I think the the osteoarthritic pain is kind of a um, a unique player in the ter terms of the um, inflammatory conditions that gabapentin might be appropriate for. And the reason for that is that, again, like osteoarthritic pain is kind of a complicated pain state. Um, and what they find is that the kind of clinical symptoms that patients both in human and veterinary medicine exhibit may or may not correlate with radiographic evidence of arthritis. So the thinking is that there is, to a certain extent, the structural changes that are inflammatory um, associated with arthritis, but there's also kind of like a heightened activation of peripheral nociceptors within the synovium and surrounding joint capsule that kind of lead towards that um, uh, breakthrough and on the way towards like a wind, wind up. up pain yeah. state. Exactly. Which is where the gabapentin would, would come in um, to use. And so it's kind of, there, there's some thinking that there's a little bit of a neuropathic component to osteoarthritic pain on top of um, the arthritic pain. And I wouldn't say it's there in every individual, but in people who are particularly affected or, or patients of ours who are particularly affected by arthritis, there might most likely be um, a dual component to it. And then in this capacity, we were definitely going mm -hmm. to be giving it with lots of other medications, you know, um, exactly, <laughs> you know, a lot of these protocols for treating <laughs> yes. 
arthritis are really multimodal. Yep. I mean, there's lots of things going on. Exactly. There's NSAIDs, there's injections right. of, you know, um, glycosamine and glycan, there's a lot of people right. still use, you know, glucosamine and other supplements. Right. And now we're right. having things like these newer monoclonal antibodies. Mm-hmm. Um, and right. so, you know, are, are there studies about giving gabapentin with these other medications? Do you have concerns about that? I would say that I, I don't think there are studies looking at side effects or contraindications with any of the medications. There are certainly some studies looking at in combination and haven't documented side effects um, based on its mechanism of action and the mechanism of action of the other um, kind of more traditional um, treatments for osteoarthritic pain, like non anti-inflammatories and our um, adequans and, you know, glycosamine and glycans and things like that. I think that it can be used in combination um, with those drugs. The monoclonal antibodies are pretty new to the veterinary market um, or kind of research domain. So I, I don't think we have a lot of information out there in terms of if, if we know of any side effects. The only things that I've seen in the literature is the looking at um, the administration of monoclonal antibodies in a short-term period with non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, and they didn't see any adverse effects, but that was only in dogs, and they haven't looked at really like long-term effects. So I would say that is still a little bit to be determined, um, but we haven't documented anything um, in terms of with kind of some of the, the treatment modalities that have been around for a while. And then the last place we really want to talk about gabapentin is Mm -hmm. in conjunction, you know, with a multimodal therapy for cancer pain. Cancer pain, definitely something that, you know, a Mm -hmm. lot of our patients experience and we really want to handle this well. So Mm -hmm. are there particular neoplastic conditions that you feel gabapentin is more suited for than others? Yeah. And I think it kind of goes down to thinking about which ones have like a really strongly neuropathic component to it would be kind of like uh, similar to I intervertebral disc disease would be the ones that make the most sense in terms of it. So, um, you know, like peripheral nerve sheath tumors, um, tumors in the spinal cord that are not amenable to surgery and are going through radiation therapy, um, things like that. But then also, if you think about it again, like cancer pain is really complex and you could have um, inflammatory pain from tumor necrosis um, or you could have that big tumor compressing a muscle or a nerve, which would then elicit kind of a neuropathic type of pain state. So um, I think people probably already are or are going to get tired of hearing me say it, but it's really where gabapentin fits is when you have your traditional line of analgesics, like a lot of cancer patients are on um, non-steroidals because of the wonderful COX-2 inhibition that can also be anti-neoplastic. So if they're on that already, or even say like prednisone, which does have anti-inflammatory properties, um, but they're still painful, that's when you start to layer on something like gabapentin to kind of work synergistically with those kind of more first line carbohydrate layer of the of, <laughs> of our pyramid. Right? <laughs> oh, exactly. Exactly. And so I'm glad you brought up steroids because that was going yep. to be the very next thing I asked, you know, whenever, well, <laughs> I mean, when we think about cancer, there's a lot lymphoma, mm-hmm. you know, lots of places that steroids sure. play into, you know, our management, especially as a general right. practitioner, I don't always have mm-hmm. patients going for, you know, the complicated chemotherapy protocols and things like that. And so right. we're falling back. Right. a little bit on on some of those others. But uh, mm-hmm. gabapentin appears to be safe uh, with steroids and with chemotherapeutic agents that you're aware of? Yeah, I would say f- that as far as I know, gabapentin appears safe to be administered alongside um, with steroids for sure. Um, chemotherapeutic agents, I think that Um, I don't know that they've actually looked at it or document it, particularly in our veterinary patient. There's not studies out there to say it. Um, What I would say is if you kind of start to take a little bit of a dive into the human literature, they actually use um, gabapentin in cancer patients, but for kind of like really odd, oddly um, conceivable uses, like it's used to treat nausea in cancer patients. So I think it's treated 
um, or it's used in, in human medicine in combination, most likely with a lot of the chemotherapeutic agents we're using. But again, we don't have a lot of that data um, that we've looked at it in our cancer patients um, within our own field. So let's wrap up with kind of some places where we don't use it. You know, I had said at the top of the episode <laughs> that, you know, anticonvulsant was not mm-hmm. one of the things you listed, even though that's really what the medication sure. was intended for. And it's, you know, it's listed right. as an anticonvulsant in Plum's veterinary drugs, mm-hmm. you know. Um, right. Do you, right. is there ever a time, and I know you're not a neurologist, but <laughs> do <laughs> <I know. laughs> Like, would you add it on as a third or fourth anti-epileptic? Or the other thing, the other thing that always comes to mind for me is if I have mm-hmm. a patient that has a history of seizures mm-hmm. and also needs pain control, um, does that right. influence your likelihood of prescribing gabapentin? Right. Yeah. And and those are both really good questions. And and yeah, I was gonna say that if if I'm prescribing anti-epileptic drugs for a patient, <laughs> I think there is there. <laughs> They're in a lot of trouble if I'm managing their seizures, but, um, but, you know, I have kind of asked some of my colleagues who are um, neurologists and, and, you know, that's what they do managing Mm -hmm. um, seizures in a lot of their patients Um, and kind of from asking around. Yeah. Gabapentin is probably like a fifth or sixth line agent um, as an anti-epileptic drug. Um, And if they were to use it, um, they would probably use pregabalin, which was, it's in the same um, class as gabapentin. It's just kind of like a pro drug. Mm -hmm. Um, And the main reason for that is that based on the metabolism, the dosing frequency is a lot more um, realistic for owners to be able to manage. Um, But if, again, if you kind of scrutinize and think about um, gabapentin's mechanism of action and how it might play a role as an anti-epileptic drug, we talked earlier about how it was originally intended to work and they were hoping it would be a, a centrally acting Um, GABA receptor agonist. And we know that um, some of our more traditional anti-epileptic drugs like phenobarbital and the benzodiazepines, that's where they work. Um, Our other anti-epileptic drugs are those wonderful drugs that have like this murky mechanism of action (laughs) that you just kind of have to believe how they work. (laughs) But if you think kind of um, like I like to think in broad categories and anti-epileptic drugs either, you know, prevent a seizure from happening or kind of delay the spread mm-hmm. of, of a seizure from, from continuing. Right. And if we think about gabapentin, it's going to kind of in some of those nerves and nerve terminals within the central nervous system, um, if it binds to the receptor and blocks some of the influx of calcium, and then decreases those excitatory mediators from coming out, it's conceivable to think that if you have a seizure circuit going sure. within the CNS, that gabapentin could help stop could the spread. Dampen so that. I think the reason it's probably not exactly. Mm-hmm. So probably the reason it's not a first line anti-epileptic is it's pretty hard pressed to make a case for it to be able to prevent a seizure from happening, but it might stop them from continuing. Um, and then in terms of if a patient does have a history of seizures, do you worry about using gabapentin as um, an anxiolytic or um, something for analgesia. And I would say I wouldn't be overtly um, cautious or, or concerned for using it in that patient population, but I would take a couple of things kind of into consideration. And, and the first is that um, we, as we talked about, some of the main side effects of gabapentin or sedation and ataxia. So if you already have a patient who's maybe semi-sedate from some of their other anti-epileptic drugs, um, you really don't want to kind of add to that sedative effect if your aim is to treat kind of like a painful condition. Um, And the same thing for patients that already have ataxia, either from just hind end weakness or from a neurologic disease, you don't want to make that worse by by giving them gabapentin because that could... um, you know, real, really impact their quality of life sure. if, if their ataxia or, or weakness um, kind of gets worse. Um, the other thing that I don't think has been documented at all in veterinary medicine, but in people, 
um, they've actually, they have some concern that if people are on gabapentin long-term and stop it abruptly, they have seen seizures oh. in people. Um, so they're actually advised to kind of like gradually wean off of gabapentin if they've been taking it kind of as a chronic, um, for a chronic condition. So for a patient that has a history of epilepsy, and we know that gabapentin might do something to kind of like layer on top of their anti-epileptic drugs, I would just be cautious that the owners don't stop it um, abruptly and that they kind of like wean off and think about that it might actually be contributing to a certain extent to their um, maintenance therapy sure, sure. <laughs> and, and not to just kind of think of it only as the an analgesic drug. I hadn't heard that at all. So that was, that's really good. Yeah. That's a really great tip and information. <laughs> I will carry that yeah. forward. <laughs> So what do you think looking to the future? Do you think that gabapentin is going to be continue to be so widely prescribed? Um, or do you think that we're going to start to refine a little bit about how we're using it, especially with, with, so I've seen just so many studies coming, you know, down mm -hmm. the pipe. Yeah. Yeah. I, I really hope that we, we do start to refine it. I, I think that, um, we kind of latched onto it mostly also because of the way that it, it is prescribed um, still kind of, you know, very freely mm -hmm. in human medicine. And so I think a lot of our practice, you know, we extrapolate and we see what's going on in human medicine and kind of uh, refine from there. Um, so I think we really latched onto it as tramadol fell out of favor and we're kind of looking for an oral analgesic for our patients. Um, but I hope as the data starts to come out and as we start to understand how it works, um, how pain signaling works and where it might fit in to um, the treatment of pain in our patients that we refine how we use it. Um, I would say that I think that there is a significant kind of like human psychology component to the prescribing practices, both in, in human and veterinary medicine. Um, the like in human medicine, practitioners are desperate for some type of analgesic that's not an opioid. And we're pretty desperate for one that we can give, send owners home with that's not necessarily a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory because yep. there's a lot of patients who have contraindications and can't receive mm -hmm. them. So we just, we want something and <laughs> we want to be able to treat our patient's pain. Right. Um, you want something that so works, exactly. you know? <laughs> yes, exactly. exactly. It's kind of my retirement plan to try to find <laughs> something that works that we can send patients home with. Um, so I think there's that desire um, to treat patients that we have presented before us with pain. Um, but I think what we really need to do is, is scrutinize um, where it fits in to that population and where it really is truly going to be effective. Because kind of as, as we talked about earlier, there really is a growing concern about its abuse um, within the human population. And, and we're, we're part of that um, setting, mm -hmm. you know, like it's our responsibility just as much not to send it um, home where it could be diverted. So if, if we're kind of freely prescribing large quantities of gabapentin, we don't have, we're kind of lax on our refill authorizations. Um, and if it's for conditions that it's really not indicated, um, like I'm, I am not a great compliant owner. If I don't really think that my, <laughs> my pet needs it, I stop giving it, you know, and it goes into the medicine closet. And so it might not be your direct client who will abuse gabapentin, but if you send it a large quantity home for a condition where it's not really needed, most likely they're going to stop giving it. It'll sit there and then it's there for whoever kind of rifles through and decides that, that it would be a good drug to to abuse. Yeah. So I, I do hope we kind of tighten the reins a little bit. Yeah. And I think, I think veterinarians are really open to having that discussion and to moving in mm -hmm. that direction from everything that I've seen anyway, yeah. you know, on message boards and listservs yep. and, and social media, yeah. you know, people are having a real, right. um, uh, conversation about, mm -hmm. are we using this correctly? Should we be using it this right. much? So hopefully right. this conversation right. today agree. has helped everyone. <laughs> it's really helped me. Yes. <laughs> and <laughs> Excellent. Um, our regular listeners know that this is the yep. time in the episode where I get to put you on the spot a little bit and <laughs> we play a little game at the end of our episodes. It is, oh, it, boy. Oh, it's so easy. It's just, it's just some would you rather <laughs> questions. It's just for fun. Okay. There's no right or wrong answer. Perfect. Okay. Oh, good. Okay. 
Okay. So if you had to pick, would you rather intubate a Komodo dragon or would you rather intubate a giraffe? Oh, Komodo dragon. Really? I'm, I'm short. There's no <laughs> way. Like a giraffe requires me being on like I, some sort of step stool or ladder. And, and I would feel like you would need like two people <laughs> to hold the tube, like one on each side, because it would be so Absolutely. big. Yeah. Yep. Much bigger, much bigger effort. So Komodo dragon. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I might have lied a little bit when I said that the questions weren't hard, because I think you might actually have a hard time with this one. If you oh boy, okay. if you had to choose, would you rather continue teaching but not get to practice anymore or continue practicing but no longer teach? Oh, I knew it. I'm sorry. Oh, geez. Yeah, that is like an impossible question. And then so I'm going to give you a non-answer, <laughs> basically. So. Uh, there's no way I could give up practicing, but every day you can teach, mm -hmm. honestly. Mm -hmm. And it's never going to, it doesn't have to be that you're teaching in a classroom right. or um, teaching, you know, giving a lecture or, or if it's formal teaching. But I, I find that like um, every day, no matter what you're doing, you're learning and teaching something. So my non-answer is that I choose to do both. <laughs> You would practice, <laughs> and in practicing, you would continue teaching. Yeah, I love it. Exactly. I love it. Okay, this one might be hard too, though. Would you rather practice okay. without gas anesthetics or without local anesthetics? And you have to choose this time. Oh, that's easy. Gas. Gas? Oh, oh for sure. You take the locals oh, yeah. all the time. Yeah. I have yeah, heard more and sure. more anesthesiologists saying that. Like, <laughs> those local anesthetics, we have got to be using them all the time. They literally, I, I would say that every single patient should have some sort of local anesthetic included in their protocol. And, and for me, like working without gas, um, it's a challenge and it's fun. And the more syringe pumps you have on your table, the more interesting your case is. So I definitely local anesthetics all the, the way. The idea of multiple <laughs> syringe pumps has me really stressed out. So we <laughs> Exactly. All right. Would you rather be stuck in the clinic with a yowling hyperthyroid cat or a husky that was dysphoric and howling? Oh, wow. Oh, wow. Um, is the is the yowling hyperthyroid cat a Siamese cat or is it? Uh, you can choose that. <laughs> like, I'm not going <laughs> to. Oh, boy. I'm going to say I'm going to go with husky. Okay. I think yep. because I think eventually I can win the husky over with a food puzzle. Oh, that's and yep. and the cat no. <laughs> cats, mm -mm. yeah, they're just like no, nope, no, thank you. <laughs> okay, last question: If you okay. were going to have lunch with Doctor Doolittle, would you want it to be I... Robert Downey Jr.'s version of Doctor Doolittle, or would you rather have mm -hmm. Eddie Murphy's character? Oh boy. Um, I'm going to go with Eddie Murphy. I really, I really like a good laugh. And I think that he would, I think that he would have a pretty good uh, kind of um, funny twist to yeah. it for sure. Yeah. I, so, I agree yeah, with you a hundred percent. I would be with Eddie Murphy as well. <laughs> I mean, and I love Robert Downey Jr. Love him sure, as Iron Man, for sure. but as Dr. Doolittle, I want Eddie Murphy too. <laughs> yep. Exactly. <laughs> well, that was it. You you made it through. It wasn't awesome. that bad, right? <laughs> <laughs> no, it was really fun. Like I said, I, I can talk about gabapentin for hours. So yep. I appreciate the opportunity for sure. Oh, and I'm sure everyone, you know, really enjoyed the conversation. I know I did. Good. Excellent. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you for joining us. We'll see everybody next time. <laughs> Thank you for listening to today's episode. If you enjoyed our episode, you can find us wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts, including a video version now available on YouTube. While you're there, make sure you subscribe, rate, and review us. You can also listen to or watch our podcast episodes on our website at cliniciansbrief.com slash podcasts, or drop us a line at podcasts at briefmedia.com. Clinicians Brief the Podcast is a brief media production produced by Alexis Ussery and hosted by Dr. Alyssa Watson.